Got it on. <clears throat> All right, everyone come on in, have a seat. Grab your snack. We've got a great beginning for our weekend. Really, really appreciated Larry's presentation. As you come in, let me uh, urge you to be here in the morning, bright and early. <coughs> now, to be honest about it, I've forgotten what the schedule says about what time we start. What time does the schedule say we start? We start at 8.30. First presentation at 8.30. Alan Bondar will be uh, speaking to us. Uh, Alan is just a great guy. Love his material. Love his enthusiasm. Love his book. So... Uh, be sure to be here. We will have coffee and donuts here in the morning to help you wake up. All right. So you don't want to miss that. The doors will be open and you're more than welcome. Come in and like I said, have coffee and donuts. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let, let me begin my presentation with telling you a story from my youth. My father was a minister. His father before him was a minister. One of my brother-in-laws was a minister. We used to live at a little place called West Fork, Arkansas, which was south of Fayetteville. And every Sunday afternoon, my father, my brother-in-law, and one of my brothers would get in a side room of the house. We all got together every Sunday. And my father and my brother-in-law and one of my brothers would study the Bible. And invariably, almost every single week, the topic of Matthew 24 would come up. And I used to hear my father say repeatedly, I can't figure this out. I know that Matthew 24, 29 to 31 talked about the coming of the Lord. But verse 34 said it would happen in that generation. I know he didn't come in that generation. I don't know how to explain that. My brother-in-law had a little bit of a concept of apocalyptic language. He would explain to him, this is metaphoric language. And my father would start to accept that and he would struggle with it. Until the day he died, my father was very open about expressing his uncertainty about the meaning of the Olivet Discourse. And when I was in, quote, preacher school, unquote, form of seminary in the Churches of Christ, that same kind of confusion was running rampant with the professors that I had. They would openly state, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse is a very, very difficult section of Scripture. Burton Kaufman, a noted commentator in the Churches of Christ, in his commentary on the Olivet Discourse, said Jesus purposely made his discussion in Matthew 24 confusing to prevent his disciples from understanding the doctrine of eschatology. And as a result of that, you have one verse talking about A.D. 70, the very next verse, without any indication whatsoever of a change of topic, it supposedly, according to Burton Kaufman, jumps to the end of time. I will never forget reading Burton Kaufman's comments on that and going, what kind of a theology is it that says Jesus purposely confused his apostles and therefore purposely confused us? I find that completely unacceptable. When we come to discuss the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25 is without any doubt whatsoever the fountain, the source, and the foundation of virtually all New Testament eschatology. Paul makes it a point of saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14, This I say to you, by the word of the Lord. It is generally acknowledged among critical scholars that what Paul was saying there, 
I am telling you, I am reminding you of what Jesus said when he was here in his personal ministry. Well, as a matter of fact, if you will make a comparative chart on the one side, put Matthew 24, 29 to 34. On one side, the constituent elements of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, with a shout, with the with uh, archangel, uh, on the clouds, blah, blah, blah. And you'll do the same with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, you will find that they match perfectly. And yet, what do we find? The great majority of commentators, they go to Matthew 24, 29 to 31, and by the, by the great majority of commentators, I mean the, the majority of amillennial and postmillennial commentators, they tell us, well, of course, Matthew 24, 29 to 31 is typical apocalyptic, typical prophetic a prophetic langu language that was never intended to be interpreted literally. Well, amen. Thank you very much. But they come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 and following, and they insist in a wooden, rigid literalism of a five foot five Jewish man coming out of heaven riding on a cumulus cloud with the literal shout of, a, of, of an angel with the literal sound of a trumpet at the so called end of the Christian age. But be that as it may, it is without a doubt that Matthew 24 and 25 serves as the foundation. The book of Revelation, as many, many commentators have acknowledged, is John's version of the Olivet Discourse. Everything that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and 25 is contained in the book of Revelation. Some scholars have pondered, say, wait a minute, you got Matthew 24 and 25, you got Mark 13, you got Luke chapter 21. So you got Matthew, Mark, and Luke all containing Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Why didn't John, in his gospel, include the Olivet Discourse? Well, he didn't want to because he wanted to give us the broader, longer version, expanded version of the Olivet Discourse. So again, what I'm sharing with you here is that the Olivet Discourse is the fountain of New Testament eschatology, of Jesus' eschatology. I would suggest to you that there's not a doctrine in the New Testament, and that includes 1 Thessalonians 4, or 1 Corinthians 15, and the entirety of the book of Revelation. There's not a doc, a, an eschatological doctrine in the New Testament that is not touched upon or impacted by the Olivet Discourse. There are essentially two basic doctrines, or two basic tenets, I should say positions, about the Olivet Discourse. Number one, we are told that there are two subjects discussed in Matthew 24 and 25. The disciples asked, tell us when shall these things, that's the fall of Jerusalem, that occurred in AD 70, and what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And that's supposed to be his literal, physical, bodily coming at the end of the Christian age. So, one of the basic tenets of the view of Matthew 24 and 25 is there are two subjects discussed. Now, obviously, there's the preterist view that the entirety of the, of the Olivet Discourse refers to the end of the Old Covenant age in AD 70, but we're not talking about that right now. The second view of the Olivet Discourse is that when, when the disciples asked, tell us when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, that in Matthew 24, Jesus never discussed the fall of Jerusalem at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus never mentioned the fall of Jerusalem until Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. Now that's the dispensational view of the Olivet Discourse. You can see that documented in Thomas Ice and Tim LaHaye and any of your major dispensational writers. So, what we want to do is to discuss the Olivet Discourse. <clears throat> and what I want to do is present to you an approach to the Olivet Discourse, to be honest about it, that I've never seen presented before. Now, that doesn't mean that others haven't talked about the same concepts and the same ideas. But insofar as setting the context for understanding the entire discourse, I've not seen anybody approach it quite like this. So I hope you'll follow along. I think you'll see the logic of it. I think you'll see the power of it as we continue. In order to understand that context, we don't jump in at Matthew 24. That's the wrong thing to do. 
Sometimes chapter divisions can be horrible. As a matter of fact, very often they can be. I know that they were created to help us. Sometimes they may. Sometimes they confuse us. But the real context of the Olivet Discourse is Jesus' temple discourse in Matthew chapter 23. And for that, we will jump in at verse 34. Now, obviously, the entirety of the chapter is our context, but we don't have time for that. Jesus, standing there in the temple in the very last week of his ministry, castigated the leaders and the people of Jerusalem. And he said, quote, Therefore, indeed, I send to you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all of the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias and of Erechai, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all of these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem! My goodness, just feel the pathos in the heart of Jesus as he uttered those words. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. But behold, I, verily I say unto you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'd really like to discuss those last two verses, but I don't have time. So we go on. What I'm saying to you is Jesus' temple discourse sets the stage and it sets the context for understanding Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Here's what I want you to ask yourself. The disciples have just heard Jesus' temple discourse. They have just heard him say of the temple, your house is left to you desolate. As they began to leave the temple, the disciples began to point out the beauty and the size of the stones of that temple, according to Mark and Luke. And Jesus says, do you not see all of these things? And by the way, did you realize that some of the architectural stones for the foundation of the temple uh, uh, at Jerusalem are some of the largest architectural stones ever used for any building in the history of the world? Yeah, it was really awesome. And Jesus says, do you not see all of these things? The time is coming in which not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. Now again, here's what I want you to ask yourself. As Jesus predicted the fall of that city and of that temple, what would those disciples have thought about? Well, I can tell you this. The majority of commentators say, oh, wow, you know, uh, when Jesus heard or excuse me, when the disciples heard Jesus' prediction of the fall of the temple. For instance, John Calvin said, the disciples of Jesus could not imagine the destruction of that temple were it, uh, 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 were it not at the end of time and the destruction of the earth. <laughs> the very first time I read John Calvin's comments on that, I thought, hmm, I guess the disciples were totally ignorant of what happened in 586 B.C. then. What would have gone through the disciples' minds when Jesus said that temple was going to be torn down, not one stone left standing on another? Well, I want to suggest to you, and we will document that in this lesson. That's why I'm approaching it like I am. The disciples' knowledge of history, their knowledge of prophecy and fulfillment, would have suggested to their minds several things. Number one, they knew, folks, listen to me. The disciples knew that in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed and it was called the Day of the Lord. What are they asking about? Well, Lord, tell us, uh, what's going to be the sign of your coming? Actually, literally, parousia, which segues into the very next, very next point. The disciples knew that in the 586 destruction of Jerusalem, it was, as a matter of fact, the presence and the parousia of the Lord. Are you aware of the fact that Josephus uses the very term power 
and glory to speak of Yahweh's actions in Old Testament days of the Lord, in which Yahweh in His sovereignty used one nation to judge a nation and never once came out of heaven literally, visibly, bodily. Not once. Josephus used the word parousia. Now, the more common word, and the word that is used in some of the passages that we're going to use, is the Greek word in the Septuagint, of course. It is the Greek word prosopon. Prosopon means face. More specifically, it means nose. So, if you want to get just super, super technical in the Old Testament, when it says, they shall flee from the presence of the Lord, <laughs> they're going to flee from the nose of the Lord. Well, that's not a real good, <laughs> that's not kind of a fear-inspiring insp uh, thought, is it? But it's face. The disciples knew that when Yahweh destroyed nations in the Old Testament, it was His prosopon. His face, His presence. They likewise knew that in the Old Testament, when the Lord destroyed Jer Jerusalem, He destroyed heaven and earth. They knew that in the previous comings of the day of the Lord, the Lord came out of heaven. They knew that He came with a shout. They knew that He came with flaming fire. They knew that He came on the clouds of heaven. And yes, I'm going to document every one of these. But I just wanted to give you a snapshot, you know, Reader's Digest thumbnail uh, idea of what those disciples would have had in their mind. Larry gave us a, an excellent presentation a bit ago on some of the rules of hermeneutic. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. What would the first century readers, what would the first century listeners have thought when they heard the original message. You remember the one chart Larry put up there and he said, we're going to make this as simple as we can. And he showed a copy of Larkin's chart. Did everyone recognize the chart? Most of you, I'm pretty sure will. One of the most convoluted, one of the most complex charts that's ever been created in the entire history of theology. It is incredible. Can you imagine a first century disciple hearing about the coming of the Lord, thinking, oh yeah, that's, that's right, oh, oh yeah, right here on Larkin's chart. They would have had no such concept. I would suggest to you that un unless you and I have a firm grasp and a proper understanding of the old, con old covenant concept of the day of the Lord, we are basically doomed to misinterpret New Testament eschatology. I have said this on many different occasions in many of my books. And I have said I've been castigated for this in public debates and private conversations. I have said there are no New, New Testament eschatological prophecies. The New Testament writers make it abundantly clear that their eschatological hope was the expectation of the imminent fulfillment of God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel. And yet the vast majority of Bible students today, when they come to the New Testament, oh, well, it's, I mean, it says he's going to come out of heaven on the, uh, riding on a cloud with a shout and a, and a voice and, and uh, you know, the sound of a trumpet. Well, that hasn't happened. Everybody knows that hasn't happened. We need to understand what would the first century disciples, when Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, what would those disciples have thought about? What was it in their culture, in their education, in their understanding that would have made them think, Oh my goodness, he's predicting the end of the world. I want to suggest to you that not one single thing in the entire corpus of the Old Testament would have led them to believe that Jesus was coming back at the end of human history. So, <clears throat> point number one, <clears throat> the, the, the B.C. 586 coming of the Lord, or I should say destruction of Jerusalem, was in fact the coming of the Lord. 
How many of you have read Zephaniah lately? <coughs> okay. Awesome! At least three of you. <laughs> I, I'm going to do a DVD series in the not too distant future on Zephaniah. This is one awesome book. Of course, I, I say that about every book that I start spending time with. <laughs> it becomes my favorite book. You know, you know how that goes. Anyway, Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 to 16. The Lord says, quote, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man, man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land. Now, some translations say, I will cut off man from the face of the earth. So do you know what happens here? My dispensational friends and some all millennialists go, oh, well, see, this has got to be the end of time because God says he's going to cut off man from the face of the earth. He's going to destroy the earth. And I would suggest to you that there's a total misunderstanding of Hebraic apocalyptic language. But we continue. The stumbling blocks along uh, with the wicked, I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch, wait a minute. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolat idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and wear oaths by the Lord, swear oaths by the Lord, excuse me, but also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, have not sought the Lord nor inquired by Him. And I broke this up so that you could see bigger print, okay? Be silent in the presence, prosopone, face of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Uh, by the way, when Zephaniah wrote, the fall of Jerusalem was no more than 10 to 15 years away. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. By the way, do you know, do you know who the guests of the Lord were for the feast that he had prepared? It was the vultures. Not a pleasant feast. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men will cry out. That is the day of wrath. How many times in the New Testament do you think we read about the day of wrath? Where did that language come from? Hmm. It is a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm. How many constituent elements of eschatology do we find right here in Zephaniah chapter 1? But what's it talking about? Well, it tells us what it's talking about. Number one, it's the day of the Lord. It is the face of the Lord. In other words, it's the parousia of the Lord. It is a day of darkness. It is a day of clouds. It is a day of trumpets. It is a day of destruction. Now, has anyone ever suggested that in 586 B.C., Yahweh came out of heaven, literally, visibly, bodily? Nope. Not, at least no commentator I'm aware of. But let me suggest something to you. If you're going to be a dispensationalist and say, well, okay, th this, is, this is literally the end of time coming of the Lord. You know what that means, don't you? Oh, well, let's see. Go back up and look at it. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So if you're a dispensationalist and you're going to take the position that this is at the end of the age, what happens to Ju Judah and Jerusalem at the end of the age? Oops. They're destroyed. Guess what? Dispensationalists don't believe that. All right. Point number two. When the disciples heard Jesus predict the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, I suggest to you, they would have thought about the destruction of heaven and earth. Jeremiah chapter 4, 23 through 29. Jeremiah said as he saw the impending invasion by, Bab by the Babylonian hordes, quote, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. I wonder where he got that language, by the way. You know where he got it. The heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, in, and indeed there was no man. Sound like Zephaniah, doesn't it? I'll destroy man from the face of the earth or the face of the land. 
And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and it, all of its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord, the prosopon of the Lord. What do we find? We have the parousia, if you please, the prosopon, the presence of the Lord, and the destruction of heaven and earth. Did literal, physical heaven and earth perish at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in B.C. 586? Well, I'm pretty sure it didn't. Because we're still here, aren't we? And they were still there when Jerusalem and the temple was, was destroyed in 586 B.C. Look at what Jeremiah continued saying. <clears throat> For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full land. Sounded like it, though, didn't it? <laughs> the earth was without form and void. I mean, that sounds like it's a total destruction, but the Lord says, well, not really. So it says, I will not make a full end. In other words, he's going to save a remnant. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above shall be black, because I have spoken, I have purposed, I will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city. What city? Jerusalem. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. Folks, this is the destruction of Jerusalem. In 586 B.C., and yet it is the total desolation. It is the destruction of heaven and earth. It is the presence of the Lord. It is, to reiterate, a time of darkness, a day of gloom, in which the heavens above are black, the mountains shake and tremble, and the land is made desolate. In B.C. 586 and earlier, and we, we want to look at this because this, this deals with the time of the destruction of Israel, the ten northern tribes, at the hands of the Assyrians. All right? I might could have put this first, but I just didn't want to. In Micah chapter 1, verses 2 to 10, and it specifically tells us that this is against Samaria and Jerusalem. Quote, Hear all you people, listen, O earth. By the way, that's what you call a Hebrew parallelism. You know what that means? You know what a Hebrew parallelism? Well, it says something in the first line, and it repeats it in different form in the second line. You know what that means? It means that the people here are the earth. That's exactly what that means. Unless you, unless you can show this is not a parallelism, but it is a parallelism. Well, that's a digression. Okay. Hear all you peoples, listen to earth and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. For behold, watch this. The Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. And the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like water is poured down a steep place. All this, all of what? Well, let's see. The mountains will melt, run down into the valleys. And the Lord will come down, come out of heaven, and tread on those mountains to make them melt. All of this for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Verse 6, Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down, pour down her stones into the valley. I will uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her pay as a harlot shall be burned with fire. All her idols I will lay desolate. For she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Now, I want to jump forward, even though it's not really forward temporally or chronologically, to Isaiah chapter 64. I, I got to tell you, I love this text. I, I just absolutely love this text because Isaiah 64, 65, and 66 is the fountain for the New Testament teaching about what? The new heaven and the new earth. Peter said he was looking for the new heaven and new earth at the day of the Lord as promised in the Old Testament. 
Where did he get his doctrine of the coming of the Lord to bring in the new heaven and new earth? Isaiah 64 to 66. Okay, now watch this, folks. If ever there's an appropriate place to say, you got to catch the power of this, this is it. Oh, that you, this is Israel crying out. Some say it's just the prophet. Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to argue about it. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. Stop reading. Don't anybody read anymore. I don't want you reading. Okay. What does it sound like Isaiah wants to happen? Well, I want God to come. I want him to burn up the earth. You know, I want the mountains to tremble. I want the nations to know that he's God. Okay, that's fine. Sound like the end of time. It sounds like the earth and the elements therein burning up. Oh, but wait. What is the prayer again? Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down. I got to tell you this. Curtis Cates, former director of the Memphis School of Preaching, wrote a little book. It's really bad. (laughs) But anyway, he wrote a book attempting to refute covenant eschatology. And he said, now... There's no question whatsoever that there are passages in the Old Testament that talk about God coming in judgment of nations. However, the difference between those comings of the Lord, those historical comings of the Lord, and the New Testament coming of the Lord is the fact that in the New Testament it says He would come out of heaven and there's no place, he emphasized this, there's no place in the Old Testament to speak of a day of the Lord, a historical day of the Lord, in which God came down. I've got that, you know, great big, bold, yellow, highlighted, starred, underlined, x in my copy of his book. Now here's a man who is a director of a school of preaching, was, Brother Cates passed away some years ago. And he says there's not a place in the Old Testament that said, speaking of God's actions within history, in which he came in judgment of any nation, in which it says he came down. What did Micah say? For behold, I will come down out of heaven. I will walk on the top of the mountains and the mountains shall melt. Oh, wait a minute. What did Isaiah say? Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down. The mountains might shake at your presence. Prosopone slash Parousia, your presence. As fire burns brush wood, as fire bar- water causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. Now, what does Isaiah go ahead to say? Point number one, remember, he wants God to come out of heaven, right? And now he says, Lord, when you did, that's past tense, Awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountain shook at your presence, and the nations trembled. Do you catch the power of that? Isaiah is praying for God to come out of heaven in the same way he had come out of heaven in previous times. Now, if God had never, ever come out of heaven, literally, visibly, bodily, to destroy, literally, the literal heaven and earth, and if Isaiah is praying for the Lord to come out of heaven to destroy heaven and earth, as he had come out of heaven in the past, then Isaiah is not praying for God to come literally, visibly, bodily, and destroy physical heaven and earth. You get that? And guess what? If Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, in his prediction of the day of the Lord and the new heaven and new earth, was anticipating the coming of the day of the Lord of Isaiah 64. Okay. 
So if Isaiah 64 could not be, absolutely could not be a coming, a literal visible bodily coming of God out of heaven. And if Peter's wanting that coming to be fulfilled, then guess what? That means the coming of the Lord of 2 Peter chapter 3 could not be an anticipation of the coming of Christ out of heaven, literally, visibly, bodily. Peter was anticipating the coming of Christ in the glory of the Father. What, what's my time? I got to hurry. I'm pretty sure I got to hurry. What time is it? My, my clock stopped working. 8.36. 8.36. Okay, we're, we're, we're on a roll here. Now, these are just some other passages. Psalms 18, Psalms 144. that talk about God coming, having come down. That's the language. So my point of it is, when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., <laughs> in 70 A.D., what would have been in the disciples' minds in regard to a coming of the Lord? <clears throat> Did they not know that in Isaiah's day, the Lord came down in judgment of Jerusalem? And yes, Assyria did judge Jerusalem. Just read Isaiah 30 or 29 through 37. They didn't destroy it because God destroyed them, but still, Jerusalem was judged. If the disciples knew that historical and prophetic background of the judgment of Samaria and Jerusalem at the coming of God out of heaven, then what is there about Jesus' prediction in Matthew 24 about the destruction of the temple that would cause the disciples to all of a sudden forget that prophetic, that historical background and say, well, you know, of course, that's the way it happened back then. But now he's going to do it totally differently. Where's the evidence for that? Let's go on. When the Lord even came in vindication, now, I mentioned to you just a moment ago that in Isaiah 29 to 37, we have the story of the Assyrian invasion of Israel. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to the British Museum, you got to go to the biblical section. In their Old Testament archaeological section, they have a bas-relief that is like 20 feet long. Now, a bas-relief is a type of sculpting. Uh, it's difficult for me to, to describe it. But point of fact is, it's an engraving that depicts the invasion of the Assyrians into Israel. It's gruesome. And in the Assyrian chronicles of that event, the Assyrian king boasts how he came into Israel and he destroyed 46 cities and he shut up the king of Israel, Hezekiah, in the city of Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. It's all right there in stone. Of course, what he didn't record was he left with his tail between his legs because the Lord killed 186,000 of his soldiers. <laughs> he wrote what they call a panegyric history. In other words, you just tell the good stuff. But in, that, in the midst of that siege of the Assyrians, the siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrians, the Lord made some marvelous promises to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, he told them first off, he said, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to shoot an arrow. I don't want you to throw a spear. I don't want you to shoot a rock. Trust in me. And I'll deliver this city. Okay, let's get real here, right? If you, if you are an Israelite general and king inside the city, and you got the Assyrians gathered around the walls with their spears and swords and bows and arrows and what have you, and the Lord says, uh, no, you don't defend yourself. Don't, don't shoot an arrow. No, no, no. Don't draw your bow. Don't throw a spear at them. Just leave it to me. What would be your reaction to that? Uh, Lord, that's not the way we win wars, you know. But here's what the Lord said. It's a promise that he made to the inhabitants of Jerusalem if they would trust in him. Isaiah 30, 27 to 33, quote, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger. Well, there's your fire. 
And his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overwhelming or overflowing stream which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. There shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You, turning to Jerusalem, you shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see, Israel had seven feast days and all of them were joyous occasions. So he's, he's basically saying, I'm, I'm going to turn your sorrow into joy. Okay, you shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept and gladness of heart as when one go, uh, goes with a flute to come into the mountain to, of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. Now watch this. The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard. Uh, let me see. The Lord will come with a shout. Hmm. And show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire. The Lord's going to come in flaming fire. Sound familiar? With scattering, with tempest, and with hailstones. For through the void... Wait a minute. For. What's the word for? Therefore. It's a connective particle that tells us the Lord's going to come. He's going to come with fire. He's going to come with tempest. He's going to come with hailstone. He's going to come with a shout, for, or just translated as because, if you wish. For through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down. As he strikes with the rod and in every place where the staff of his punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourines and harps. And in battles of brandishings, he will fight with it. For Tophet, that's the valley of Hinnom, that came to be called Gehenna otherwise known as hell. For Tophet was established of old, yes, for the king it is prepared. He, he, that is Yahweh, has made it, Tophet, deep and large, as pyre is fire with much wood, the breath of the Lord with a stream of brimstone. There's your fire once again. So what was going to happen? What was going to happen? Well, chapter 31 continues. Quote, for thus, says, for thus the Lord has spoken to me, as a lion roars and a, as a young lion over his prey when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor be destroy, d disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts... Wait a minute, this was never supposed to have been said in the Old Testament. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it. Passing over, he will preserve it. Return to him against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day, every man shall throw away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, sin which your own hands have made for yourselves. Then, then, then when? When the Lord comes out of heaven. When the Lord comes down. When he comes with flaming fire, when he comes with tempest and hailstones, when he comes with the clouds, then Assyria shall fall by the sword, not a man, and a sword, not a mankind, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be forced labor. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Now, I want to tell you something. Had you been there, present there, you would have looked at Jerusalem and you would not have seen any kind of ethereal, spiritual fire burning. They were starving to death inside the city. But God said, no, 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 my fire is burning there. Could they see it? Nope. Was it there? Yep. So let me make the point. Jesus, who is the second Jeremiah, by the way, and if you've never ex investigated the, com the, the comparisons between Jeremiah and Jesus, spend some time. Same with Ezekiel and Jesus. Absolutely fantastic. So Jesus, the second Jeremiah, foretold the coming desolation of Jerusalem, just as his forerunner had. Remember Jeremiah chapter 4? We could, we could include Jeremiah 7. We could include Jeremiah 2. We could, well, we could include the whole book of Jeremiah. 
The disciples were intimately aware of the earlier destruction and the language used to describe that event and similar events in their history. They knew that history. They knew that language intimately. Trouble is today, most Bible students are not familiar with that language and that history. Hey, look, I, I was raised believing you don't even have to study the Old Testament. You don't need it. All you got to do is carry around your New Testament. Because after all, God supposedly took the Old Testament away at the cross. Now, we, we can still tell the story of David and the lion's den, right? <clears throat> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we can still tell some of the stories of the Old Testament. But after all, for doctrine, no, no, no. You see, we need to understand that that destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. was so significant, so powerful in the psyche and in the consciousness of the people of Israel. They actually had four feast days to commemorate the four, four separate events of that invasion. You find this in Zechariah chapter 8. They had, they had feasts to celebrate the 10th month and the events of that day, the 4th month, the 5th month, and the 7th month. Just go, to, just go to Zechariah chapter 8 and read about it. Those feasts were commemorated in Israel when Jesus was here. The disciples celebrated, well, it not, it's not really a celebration, but they commemorated the fall of Jerusalem in 586 by fasting. Are we supposed to believe for even one nanosecond? That therefore, when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, the disciples' would mind would not go back to that language that was used to describe that 6th century destruction. I would suggest to you that in Matthew 24, the disciples were asking their questions in absolute perfect conformity to that language. They were not asking their questions in total isolation from their understanding and their knowledge of their history and those Old Testament prophecies. So if the disciples knew, insert the word new, if the disciples knew that the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. was the day of the Lord, if they knew it was His coming out of heaven on the clouds in flaming fire, and yet He had never come literally, visibly, and bodily in that earlier event, here's the hermeneutical question. What would be the evidence to support the idea that when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem then, that they completely ignored, set aside that Old Testament history, background, and language, and now they're thinking of something radically different? I would suggest to you that Jesus' earlier prediction I don't know why my phone is doing that. Uh, okay, what time is it? Okay, okay, I'm almost done if you'll bear with me, all right? Consider the fact that in Matthew 16, 27 and 28, Jesus had said, the Son of Man will come. How? In the glory of the Father. What does that mean? He was going to come in judgment as His Father had come in the past. Somebody wrote a book on that topic. I would recommend you get it. Okay. <laughs> Not only that, Jesus said his coming in judgment was going to be coming in judgment as the Father, as he had seen the Father act in judgment. John 5, 21 to 23. So Jesus would come as the Father had come. He would judge as the Father had judged. That therefore precludes the idea of a literal, visible, bodily, physical coming of Christ in judgment. So I ask you again. Where would the disciples have ever gotten the idea that the fall of Jerusalem was to occur at the end of human history? Now, amazingly, both amillennial and postmillennial commentators agree on the following. Number one, Christ came in AD 70. Number two, he came on the clouds. He came with the angels. He came with the sound of the trumpet. He came to gather the elect. He came at the end of the age. I can document all of this very easily from all millennial and post-millennial writers. 
It is agreed that Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31, uses this typical Hebraic apocalyptic prophetic language. I mean, folks, they agree with this. And thus they agree by implication that what the disciples asked about was in fact fulfilled in AD 70. Yet they then turn right around and they claim that what happened was not what the, what the disciples asked about. And what the disciples were, were indeed asking about had nothing whatsoever to do with verses 29 to 31. Well, I've already gone over that. So let me conclude with a couple of final points. The common assumption is that the disciples were asking about the end of time, the end of the Christian age, and a literal, visible, bodily coming of Jesus out of heaven at the end of time. I would suggest to you that in order to establish that assumption, one has to ignore key biblical truths that we have established this evening. Number one, you would have to prove that although the, the disciples knew of the B.C. 586 destruction of the temple, and they knew that time didn't end, and cre literal creation was not destroyed, that now they've got that in mind. You would have to prove that the disciples, although intimately familiar with the Old Testament use of apocalyptic language, which they did in fact use in verses 29 to 31, as, as is admitted, and yet it can't be construed to be literal, physical, but now, that's what they have in mind. And number three, the disciples knew. To me, this is one of those really, really, really simple points that just jumps off the page at me. And it's just like, wow, this is so powerful. Folks, listen, the, the disciples knew that the Jerusalem temple did not represent the Christian age. Do you, do you understand that? Where would the disciples have ever gotten the idea that the temple at Jerusalem represented the Christian age? And thus to ask, hey Lord, uh, you, just, you just predicted the destruction of the temple and so we know that that means the, that the Christian age will end one day. Oh yeah? How did that Jerusalem temple represent the Christian age. So, in closing, the futurist view of the disciples' questions is based on faulty assumptions that cannot be proven. The disciples clearly, undeniably knew that both time and creation did not end in B.C. 586. To prove that they had the end of the Christian age and end of time in mind, one must prove definitively that either, number one, the disciples knew of old other Old Testament prophecies of the end of time, of the end of the Christian age, and they had those prophecies in mind. You know what? In debate after debate after debate, I have asked my amillennial and postmillennial post -millennial opponents uh, to, to give to us an Old Testament prophecy that very clearly predicts the end of time. You know what the normal answer is? Yep, that's it. Silence. Number two, or B, they were ignoring the Old Testament definition of the day of the Lord and the metaphoric interpretation of the day of the Lord language. In other words, they knew what the Old Testament language of the day of the Lord meant. They knew it was metaphoric. They knew it was not literal of the, of the end of time. But in order to get that out of Matthew 24, you've got to prove that they had a literalistic concept of that language. C, they knew the metaphoric use of the language of the day of the Lord, but in their mind in question, they were interpreting that language literally as just suggested. D, they knew of a previous prophecy of Jesus that foretold the end of time and the end of the Christian age. And they had that prophecy in mind when they asked about the destruction of Jerusalem. Number one, where is that prophecy of Jesus prior to Matthew 24, where Jesus clearly predicted the end of the Christian age? Okay, assumption number three, found wanting. To sustain the traditional view, it must be proven that although the disciples knew, they knew that the temple did not represent the new covenant age, they were nonetheless thinking of that when they asked their questions. I suggest to you, I affirm this, 
and I'm willing to affirm this in formal debate, none of those assumptions can be proven. They are false. The fact is that the traditional futurist views of Matthew 24 are, in fact, fundamentally flawed. And what that means, what that means is that the disciples were asking about one thing. They were asking about the end of the Old Covenant age and the revelation of the presence of the Lord in the fall of that city, which occurred in AD 70. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, folks. Well, thank, let me thank you again for being here this evening. Do not forget, uh, we will start bright and early in the morning. Alan Bondar, you don't want to miss his lesson. It'll be good. All right. And once again, we'll have coffee and donuts. Uh, what we do need to ask is this. Please be sure, do not walk up here where all of the wires are. Uh, I know you're going to want to visit and what have you. Do your visiting that way. Just don't, we don't want to trip over any wires at all. Do what? <laughs> no, right. <laughs> yeah. And look, before we dismiss, I, I've just absolutely got to say an initial word of thanks to Chad Kenno. Um, you know, we, we've been so, so fortunate in the past to have people step up and help. And, and obviously, I'll be acknowledging that uh, as the week, uh, weekend proceeds. You know, Joseph Vincent was so kind to be here a couple of years and do the live stream and what have you. Well, guess what? He, he wanted to come and just be able to enjoy the seminar for a change. Uh, so anyway, last year he contacted me and I, I put a, a message on Facebook basically saying, help, because I didn't have a clue how to do any of that stuff. And, and Chad was kind enough to respond. He came last year. He did a marvelous job. And I want you to know something. Chad has spent a lot of his own money buying expensive equipment to be able to do live streaming like this, not just for us. He'll be in Michigan in August, uh, like first week, something like that, uh, for the conference up there. Uh, and if, you know, if you're going to be traveling, you want to go to that conference, it'll be a, it will be a good one. But that shows you how dedicated Chad is uh, to the movement of covenant eschatology. And he, he's been here for three days total so far. He came in two days early in order to be able to come in, make sure all the technology was working, had all sorts of glitches to work out. He got it performing. He got it done. And I want to tell you, he's not charging us. We're paying his expenses, okay? But he's not charging us what a regular IT guy would. We couldn't afford to pay a regular IT guy. Just no way possible to do that. And so uh, just appreciate him so very, very much for volunteering and for his expertise in doing this. All right, folks, any other announcement that, that absolutely needs to be made tonight? Okay, Joseph. Okay, just to kind of um, uh, uh, tie into what Don was just saying. So he didn't really give you the numbers. Don is not asking me to say this, but for those online as well watching, because we have, a, what, what do we get, like 80 people tonight watching online? Yeah, we have an average of about 80 people. Yeah, right around 80, averaging at any given time. I was, I was following along as well. It was about 70 to 80 at any time. So for those watching online, for those that are here, Chad has spent, like Don said, thousands. I'm not going to say the exact number, but it's been in the thousands, okay? Uh, renting this conference space is quite a bit of money. The food for the catering, uh, nobody has charged admission to come in here for the conference, all of that. So um, if you add it all up, it's quite a bit of money. But I just want you to know the impact you can have for those of you that are able to give at all. We are asking the people online, and even if you're here, even if you can give as little as 5 or $10 a month for 12 months, it's a commitment for 12 months, even just $10. If there's 100 people, 100 people, the 80 that are online, the people that are here in the audience, if 100 people are giving just $10 a month, that's $12,000 for a year, right? So don't minimize the impact that you can give. Don is not asking for this. He's not up here saying, hey, Joseph, I want you to give a, a little shout out, okay? This is me from my heart asking all of you, if you could even afford just $10 a month 
online, if they can give $10 a month, that would really, really, really make a giant impact in us being able to not just pay for this equipment, everything that you see here, the online streaming, the conference, everything that Don is doing and that everyone here supporting PRI is doing, but it would also enable him to do even more, right? We want this to be exponential. So if you can afford to give anything at all, please do. Well, thank you, Joseph. Yep. Don't drop the mic. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that so much. We, um, this is a mission with us. You know, we used to try to charge money to be able to do it. We decided we wanted to do it for free, but I don't have to tell you, it's not free. Uh, it costs a very, very significant amount of money for us to do this every year. And, and I'll just give you a ballpark figure. It costs us anywhere from 10 to $15,000 a year to, to host this seminar. And that money has to come from somewhere, but that's ministry. And our philosophy is this, if we can break even, it's all in the world we ask. We're not doing this to make money. This is for you, this is for the movement. And so I appreciate Joseph's comments very, very much. Anything at all that you can do is, is greatly appreciated. Some of you have been our supporters, you know, for a long time. And that just, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much we appreciate that. But, you know, things happen, life happens. We lose some support from time to time. Uh, we've lost some support this year because of health issues that pe people have had. Nothing to be done about it. You know, it's just nothing to be done about it. But it takes time to get that support back. Uh, and it's sometimes very difficult to do. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about trying to raise support. Thank you again. You're dismissed. See you in the morning. God bless.